Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome to you to this live stream. Um, I'm super excited to uh, have another one of these with my wonderful colleague, Crystal. And I'm really happy to introduce everyone to Steve Luboya, um, who heads up our uh, work on safe abortion. Um, I So uh, same rules as usual. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. We will get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, we were going to move everyone over to uh, a meeting format so that we could do the chat uh, on video in person. Um, but I think that it's just going to be easier to kind of just go straight into the chat within the webinar format. So um, just type in your questions and we will get to them at the end. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Crystal to start us off. Thanks, Anissa, and welcome, everyone. I am very excited to have this conversation today. Um, it's so much going on around the world and in Washington um, related to safe abortion and abortion policies, so um, very timely. Uh, I want to kick it off with a video from my colleague, Katya, who is based in Mozambique. And due to time differences, she couldn't be here today, but we thought her telling a bit about her story and grounding us in why we do this work is so important. So take a look. Mozambique has abortion legalized under specific conditions in our penal code since 2014. However, this service implementation only started after four years. Important to add that within less than a year of safe abortion implementation, the law was reviewed. And it was a sign that even with the legal framework, safe abortion advocacy must not stop or reduce. Abortion by itself, the word, already have a burden of stigma and discrimination. Therefore, as Pathfinder in country, we invested in values clarification sessions as a must and powerful exercise. As a result of our work with the sessions within the health facilities and communities we do support, we overcame major safe abortion barriers such as illicit collections from providers, providers and and community members judgmental counseling to pregnant young girls and women. And we had religious and community leaders speaking and discussing the role of safe abortion when in presence of an unwanted pregnancy in relation to the young girl and women's future. Many say that family planning is an option, therefore unwanted pregnancies and abortion should not be a need by choice. <laughs> Contraception and met need is still very high in most countries, including mine. Uh, therefore, safe abortion is also an opportunity to provide to this person quality of services, including information and immediate safe abortion contraception. Um, The, 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 to change the environment around us, we need to change ourselves up first from within by discussing and accepting that safe abortion saves lives and are an opportunity to this person to contribute actively to the society. That's the slowly, but we do believe, sustainable change we are now seeing after decades advocating for and implementing safe abortion. Yes, there is much still to be done. Thank you. Wow, that was a great way to kick off our conversation. And I'm really, again, with the power of technology, it's so wonderful to be here with you all today. And um, Steve, I am so happy to be with you. And I wanted to kick off our first question Katia mentions um, safe abortion a number of times. In the US con you know, context, 
we think of legal and illegal. That's what we talk about a lot. Can you explain to us a little bit what is the difference between safe abortion and legal and illegal abortion? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Crystal. Um, a safe abortion, uh, by definition, uh, WHO definition, uh, it's a procedure of terminating a pregnancy that is carried out by a person uh, uh, who is trained and having the required skill to do so, but also in, in a, a medical environment that is meeting a minimum standard. So this way of defining abortion sound to be so much focused on the procedure itself, but WHO goes beyond that to uh, provide circumstances before, during, and after the abortion that could actually uh, uh, define the safety of uh, an abortion. Uh, some of those conditions include um, the pre-abortion counseling, because it's important that the woman is supported in a respectful manner, in a, in a non-judgmental interaction with information that can help her undergoing the process of abortion and understanding what to expect. And then secondly, uh, is uh, facilities and providers uh, uh, being set uh, for immediate intervention in case the woman face maybe severe bleeding or any other emergency that might arise uh, during the, uh, the procedure of the abortion and also uh, the provision of a post-abortion checkup, because in some circumstances, uh, uh, safety of the procedure may not be confirmed only at the time of the procedure, but maybe it might require that the client comes again for a, a follow-up visit to confirm that the abortion was successful. And at last, uh, the women agency to seek timely medical care, because sometimes we do find settings where even just like uh, my colleague explained in Mozambique, that abortion is legally available, but maybe the woman don't, doesn't feel supported in the community, then if the woman doesn't have the urgency to seek timely medical care in case of complication uh, because of any maybe uh, um, development arising during the um, procedure, and maybe th those, those kind of hesitation might be caused by legal, social, or cultural environment, then uh, you don't have safety there. So safety is beyond the procedure. It includes also how the woman, the woman feels supported in terms of accessing the service and, and all the care that are surrounding the woman in terms of information and also the management of potential complications in case they arise. So um, a safe abortion uh, is unfortunately uh, uh, not legally available in all countries. Uh, in some countries, it's illegally available, but under some condition. And, and in other countries, very few countries, it's available on woman demands. Uh, and uh, um, most of the countries do have uh, 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 restrictions around uh, medical indication or social and economic indication. It varies from uh, a country to, uh, to another. But wow. one thing is that, yes. No, sorry to interrupt. Go, go, please continue. Yes, and safe abortion actually affect all women in the world, regardless to the legal context, regardless to the, the country uh, uh, level of income and so on. So um, uh, safe abortion uh, could be really the best way to go about this if it was legally available everywhere. But the reality is there, it's not legally available everywhere. Well, and what I was thinking as you were talking was it's, so it's really important that we keep emphasizing the safe part because just because you have legal abortion doesn't mean you have, like you said, the support around it to ensure that women have the access, have the supportive environment, have the post care, the pre counseling and all those things. So I think that's really important because sometimes um, many of us I think are in the United States who are on this call, we think about um, access to abortion where we live and sometimes don't think about it in context of other places, frankly, even other states in the US, but definitely like other countries. So another thing Katya said was talked about contraception. And again, that is something we take for granted. You know, if I want birth control pills, I want uh, a, a, um, a shot for birth control, I want an IUD. These are things that we say, we go to our doctors, we go to medical providers to, to get. So she said there's a real link. You know, a lot of people do believe if we have contraception, then we, you know, why do we even need abortion? Why is it even an issue? Can you talk a little bit about the linkage between contraception and access to it in abortion? Yes, uh, there's a very strong link between these two. And uh, 
and uh, also uh, similarities uh, in terms of uh, how they intervene in the human well-being. So safe abortion and contraception are both sexual reproductive rights and services uh, uh, that empower women uh, by providing with them the ability to, uh, to manage and attain their fertility goals. And this would include, for example, uh, uh, deciding when to get pregnant, either to get pregnant or not, when to get pregnant, uh, and then even when pregnant, whether to continue the pregnancy to term or interrupt it. So uh, these two services uh, do empower women in making those kind of decisions and enjoying their sexual productive uh, health. So what links these two really? Uh, there is one factor at the middle of these two is uh, the unwanted pregnancy. No access or limited access uh, to quality modern contraception will lead to unintended pregnancy. And we also know that uh, unintended pregnancy uh, is the most consequential factor leading to abortion, both induced induce safely or induced uh, in an unsafe manner. So an unintended pregnancy come as a connect in between these two, as um, abortion would help us managing an unintended pregnancy that has already occurred, while contraception would help us preventing uh, 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 actually, the occurrence of an unwanted pregnancy. Both are important because they intervene at different level of uh, 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 our strategies in the health systems in terms of preventing or managing something that has already happened. And uh, from the last 20 decades, there have been a kind of a, a, a global consensus among partners uh, and WHO included uh, in terms of uh, the importance to have a comprehensive approach, ap approach to uh, uh, unsafe abortion mortality and morbidity. And this approach is, is named comprehensive abortion care. And this comprehensive abortion care have in it three key elements, that is the provision of a safe abortion, uh, the provision of post-abortion contraception, as well as the provision of post-abortion care. As you can see there, you cannot uh, holistically address the issue of unwanted pregnancy or unintended pregnancy if you do not tackle uh, the prevention of the unintended pregnancy or the management of it when it happens. So these two are very important or to play different roles. Uh, it's unfortunate that sometimes the opposition use this uh, to justify uh, 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 the, the need to emphasize more on contraception and neglect abortion, but that's not really an argument that makes sense because we all know, first of all, that uh, even contraception have a rate, a rate of failure. You know, even if all women have to access contraception, some of them uh, the method will fail them and might need uh, to uh, to have an unwanted pregnancy managed. And we also know the reality, just like my colleague said, the reality globally in terms of uh, limited access to contraception that is going on up to now. So that, those are the linkages between these two. They go together in the way we do manage um, magnitude and safe, safe abortion. Well, that's a good clarification because I do think we hear a lot. Well, if you just have more contraception, won't you reduce the need for abortion and it may in some cases but access we know we keep going back to that access so can you tell me a little bit about why why does pathfinder work on safe abortion why is this a part of our portfolio why is this your job at pathfinder and what are some of the things that we specifically do is this something we're pushing on other countries um can you tell us a little bit more about that yes uh pathfinder does um uh, safe abortion, comprehensive abortion work uh, for, for one reason. Uh, one reason is that uh, this is uh, uh, the, the most uh, effective response uh, to one of the leading causes of maternal mortality globally, uh, which is unsafe abortion. Uh, we, we have an average of 8% of maternal mortality globally that is caused by unsafe abortion. And that average uh, doesn't show really how this can be worse in some countries, in uh, developing countries uh, like in Africa, where you have even up to 50% or 40% of uh, the maternal mortality in a country being caused by unsafe abortion. So uh, uh, this being a leading cause, uh, it requires really a special attention, which Pathfinder is committed to. And also we know, despite that uh, globally it's admitted that unsafe abortion is uh, the leading cause of mortality and that the uh, uh, provision of comprehensive abortion care is the right solution to, uh, to the problem. Uh, and uh, safe abortion is still remain the most controversial and, uh, and the most neglected uh, healthcare 
sexual uh, sexual reproductive health care. And you know the reason why all the stigma around it, all the cultural barriers and uh, around around the beliefs around uh, abortion that is really really making this uh, healthcare services uh, more restricted than any other uh, you can imagine. It's the it's the service that have more law around it. Uh, well, while other services do not have any form of regulation uh, uh, in how to provide it, who should provide it, and where it should be provided. And we need uh, people to champion this as uh, it is the most neglected uh, agenda. And even government uh, don't prioritize much uh, provision of safe abortion. Uh, you will find that uh, in, in a list of priorities in a country, uh, infectious disease may come first uh, and, uh, and, and other uh, non-communicable diseases. But for what comes to uh, sexual productive health, we still have issues in most developing countries to have safe abortion being prioritized. That's why Pathfinder is committed to support government in looking into this, uh, this social injustice that is still killing women globally. Wow, oh, it's uh, that that resonates really high. Um, maternal mortality rate of up to fifty percent due to unsafe abortion. It, it's pretty scary thinking that some of these women are leaving behind children and families who have lost them for sad reasons. And um, also, Katia mentioned user fees. Um, can you explain a little bit what that means, cutting out user fees or fees that, uh, proprietary fees? What, what is she talking about with that? Yes, um, as, as she explained, uh, safe abortion is legal in the Mozambique, and it's also part of a minimum package of healthcare services that have been provided at all level, primary up to tertiary level of care. And it should be free of charge, just like the contraception, uh, contraceptive services. But unfortunately, because of stigma and also uh, the provision of a, a conscientious objection where a provider could uh, uh, deny a woman a service on, on a personal ground, moral ground, then what happens is uh, uh, providers are uh, coming up with uh, illegal charges, uh, asking uh, illegal payment for uh, offering uh, services as they may, if they decide to, to do not offer, nothing could happen to them because they, there's provision for conscientious objection. And those illegal charges are, charges are quite high and they bring in a quite serious uh, cost uh, uh, barrier to, to, to services uh, that, that really make uh, post-abortion care still being a big problem in, in, in Mozambique. You, you will see that despite availability of these services over over almost uh, 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 half of a decade, you still have high numbers of women seeking post-abortion care in Mozambique, uh, despite that uh, favorable law. It's because a number of them may, may have been failing to access uh, the service free of charge because of uh, providers uh, coming up with uh, illegal charges. And illegal charges come in because of the service being still stigmatized. Uh, wow. Um... It's important for people to realize this and understand the conditions of which things are happening. Um, we have a few questions coming on, but I wanted to follow up one last thing. So again, majority of us are living in the US. What are some of the things that we can do to really support women around the world in these, you know, in these specific cases of unsafe abortion and help with policy changes? What are some of the things that would be helpful for us to know and to do? Yes. Um, first of all, I think I do believe uh, as a healthcare provider, uh, because I had the chance to be, first of all, uh, uh, a clinician in the in facilities uh, providing these services uh, until I joined an uh, organization to uh, champion this agenda uh, uh, at a global level. I believe that at any point of my life and everybody have something to do about uh, this uh, social injustice. And self abortion is a social injustice and it's possible that any one of us can do something. And uh, one thing I may expect, for example, now from the US uh, is everybody rising against this uh, 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 law that has been new newly passed uh, in uh, Texas where uh, gestational age has been limited to six weeks uh, for women to be uh, granted with, uh, with an abortion. 
I really hope that uh, 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 everybody could rise up, uh, not just in the US, but globally to prevent such uh, regression uh, in, uh, of uh, abortion laws in a country that has been a great example in terms of freedom, uh, in terms of freedom uh, uh, of, uh, and, and human rights. And uh, beyond that, I think for those who have the resources, who can mobilize resources, uh, uh, to address uh, a number of inequities in the world. Uh, uh, I think uh, prioritizing uh, uh, safe abortion uh, access would be something that would, have, would be very impactful uh, in terms of improving women's life and reducing maternal mortality and morbidity uh, and in, in most of the low income countries. And uh, this is through the same strategies that has been going on in terms of uh, partnering with government and NGOs, and uh, also increase again uh, uh, partnership with local organizations and communities, uh, since these, uh, these local organizations have a deep understanding of existing networks where information could be passed to women, a, a very close and a more appropriate support could be passed to women. Uh, if we could also really invest more uh, within those uh, social networks in those local organizations, uh, we, we could be more impactful uh, in terms of addressing uh, uh, this uh, social injustice of uh, unsafe abortion. Um, I think um, uh, we want also to be clear that um, women want access to comprehensive sexual reproductive health, and uh, that service shouldn't be denied to them because of uh, their uh, social uh, status or uh, income. And, and we, we want this really uh, uh, to be in the mind of all politicians and understand that uh, any decision made, uh, any policy that is uh, uh, coming out could really have different impact uh, to, uh, to people. And uh, most of the time, it's the most marginalized, the most poor people who are the most affected with those kind of measures. We want the politicians to be aware of this as, as they need to continue advocacy uh, for this. As uh, you know, that uh, any gain we've made around abortion uh, could be lost. Uh, just like Texas have lost uh, 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 freedom to access services by now limiting this to six weeks. So we need to continue advocacy and support of advocacy for um, liberalizing abortion laws. And uh, actually, why not even having laws around how to have an abortion if it's just a healthcare services? Great point, great point. I love the social justice frame because when it really comes down to it, it is women's health. And so why is it stigmatized more than anybody else's health? Um, thank you so much. So yeah. let's get to a few questions that come through. And one is asked about what is Pathfinder doing? Um, is Pathfinder doing anything to curb illegal charges? Um, and some of the information, again, that Katya mentioned, um, I think that is um, something people don't think about uh, is, but that happens when people are vulnerable and poor, people take advantage of it. Are we doing anything? I know Mozambique is doing something, but is this something that we're doing in other countries too to help curb that out or stamp that out or work with governments on that? Yes, um, it's, a quite a, it's quite a challenging uh, issue because um, what is most expected is uh, that MOH take leadership uh, in, to manage such issues because these are uh, performance issues. They are, they are there are uh, uh, actually ethics issues that uh, 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 the employer should manage. And unfortunately, sometimes Pathfinder or partners have to be the one coming in and we have to be very tactful to, to, to do not also uh, uh, dis demotivate providers who are willing to offer services as we are trying to address this problem. So what we are doing currently in Mo Mozambique is uh, we have uh, um, a sort of a, a hotline uh, where women uh, uh, could make phone calls and provide feedback about how the service they receive uh, went. And, and uh, the apostles just at the interest of procedure rooms with those numbers uh, that uh, uh, women can call and, uh, and say how they felt about the procedure, how respectful was the provider, and then did they receive the care in good time. And unfortunately, those lines are so underutilized, uh, so underutilized. Is it because women have a different understanding of quality or women are ready to pay for those illegal charges? Those are things that we need to explore more to understand. But of course, we know that uh, this is still a big problem. It's still a big barrier that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and I heard Katya mention the education, which I think is um, something important. You have to educate everyone when the laws change, but you also have to reduce stigma by making sure providers know um, as well as women know 
what the laws are and what they should, what quality they should be expecting and making sure we're meeting that quality. So that's really an important point. And I think something, unfortunately that's universal. It happens in the US too, where, you know, people, young people, especially they, you know, they don't know what to expect. So sometimes they're not treated with respect and we need to make sure that that's always respectful care is always important. And I'm gonna go to another question that stays on the same um, wavelength and then go back to one about funding. But it, a question was like, how do we systematically deal with conscious, conscientious objections by healthcare workers, especially in low and middle income countries? So those who have said, you know, it's against my religious beliefs, I don't want to do this. Um, are we doing anything with that? And are we seeing that happening very often? Yes, we see that happening very often, uh, especially in country with uh, liberal law. Uh, South Africa, Mozambique, are. Uh, kind of the country where abortion is available with very limited uh, conditions uh, where we can say we have available uh, abortion on demand. And what happened in those contexts where you find that the providers would uh, be saying that they can't offer service in the public sector, but when you find them in the private sector, they are offering the service for, for financial gain. So most of the objections are not genuine. Most of them are just because of uh, somebody willing to uh, to make money out of uh, a service that's supposed to be free of charge. So uh, what do we do about this? Uh, another, another difficult uh, issue to tackle because it again, it's about morals and ethics. Uh, we, we, we do our best to emphasize a FIGO recommendation and FIGO uh, uh, portion statement on, uh, on, on conscientious objection, which implies the need for the provider to declare his level of comfort uh, of, discomfort uh, uh, publicly at the facility uh, so that it's documented in the facility that uh, there are providers who are not willing to offer services already known and so that uh, even uh, uh, the district can manage location of providers in a way of ensuring that uh, each facility at least has somebody who is comfortable offering services instead of uh, uh, not knowing and then being surprised that uh, in a whole city maybe services are not available. So providers should be forced to declare that objection uh, publicly so that uh, it can give chance to the uh, the health system to manage uh, 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 positioning so that uh, they can secure services where where uh, uh, everywhere where the, 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 there is the will to uh, willing and means to, to offer services and also a provider who is not willing to offer service is compelled to uh, refer the woman to somebody who's comfortable mm -hmm. offering services and uh, we are advocating for a number of uh, from uh, professional bodies like uh, uh, the uh, gynecologist uh, bodies in countries to advocate for them to include the the figo uh, 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 recommendation in day in day in day uh, uh, code of conduct in countries so that uh, providers don't abuse the, the object, this objection uh, to to make women uh, failing to access services it, yeah. We have no data to document how much it's working, but it it carries fruit to do so because of at least securing services in all the geography we want to reach. No, that's a just an excellent point, and um, ensuring that you just don't limit women's choices by saying, "Oh, I don't want to provide it." They have to provide, and then also educating women in advance that these providers don't provide abortion, so you don't get caught or sent home or denied services uh, indefinitely, because we know time is very important in these cases. Um, sticking with this one more thing, I, the same theme, um, it was a question, a follow-up question around, what do we uh, think or what do you think about uh, providing abortion in uh, standalone clinics versus an integrated service model, like a primary healthcare model? Providing services in a standalone clinic or or in a primary or healthcare integrated. service, an integrated model, yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I, actually, um, we are moving uh, uh, even further uh, uh, in terms of uh, encouraging even uh, uh, non facility based services. Uh, a lot has been done in terms of ensuring facility based access to service, and that should be as per the recommendation be offered at all levels of the health system medical abortion as well as surgical abortion, and both options being available at all levels. But of course, there are some limitations in terms of second and first trimester abortion, first trimester being safely provided in the all uh, 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 level, in all the level of the health system, while second trimester abortion should be provided in hospitals. 
So uh, we want to go beyond the facility-based services because this is not uh, uh, meeting all women expectation. And we are moving toward how we could reach women in the communities and also uh, reaching women with self-care approaches. And self-care approaches are not necessarily provided in medical settings. Sometimes they're even provided in a non-medical setting like telemedicine or sometimes a, a virtual platform where women get information about how to go about their abortion and then and then they, they access to the commodity uh, by ordering the commodity virtually. And then they are also offered support in terms of information to assess their abortion success and they can seek service to the nearest facilities in case of any complication. So we are Pathfinder are embracing this new uh, way of uh, 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 reaching women because uh, we need to understand that uh, different uh, legal settings also offers different uh, opportunities for women to access uh, services. That's great. And as, as many women have access, they get to make the choices themselves and involve less people outside of their household in those decisions. I just want to clarify, so for people who don't know, medical abortion, what's medical abortion versus surgical abortion? Okay. Okay. Medical abortion, it's a, 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 it's a, a, the interruption of a pregnancy by using uh, uh, drugs. And the WHO recommended the use of uh, two drugs, the mifepristone, which is a mifepristone and misoprostol. So these drugs uh, uh, induce a contraction that could facilitate uh, expulsion of uh, the product of conception. So, so the medical the method, the, yes, yeah, the pills, the pills okay. yes, Great. the abortion pills. See, we're not as, all as smart pills, as you are, uh, Steve. You got to bring it down for us a little bit. <laughs> the abortion pills. Yes, the abortion pills are very effective, more than 95% effective when given uh, of the right dosing and the right, uh, uh, right timing, very effective and very safe, and can be even provided on a self-care basis. Uh, WHO uh, guidelines on abortion, we update very soon and we include very soon, we are expecting them to come up this year. Also, they need to uh, consider uh, scaling up access even on a self-care basis. And then the other way of doing abortion is the surgical abortion that can be done only in facilities by a trained provider. And by them, you use, we use a surgical method where you introduce something in the, the uterus to, uh, to, to, uh, to aspirate uh, the, 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 uh, the product of conception. Yeah. So, and that's one, um, the one we're more familiar abortion. with hearing about is the traditional abortion versus the medical abortion, yes. which is with the pill. Okay, good. So people are clear on the difference. And when he was talking about self-care, we don't expect people to do their own medical abortions at home, surgical abortions. It was with medication. So make sure everyone was up to speed on that. Um, we had another question about funding. Mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, being patient on that and coming back to that one. And around um, how do we find Pathfinder's work on safe abortion? And does that come from the US government? So Steve, I'll let you talk a little bit about how we do fund, we get funding, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we don't do with USG funding. Okay. Uh, I will say very little about this. Uh, I think uh, you are a better person than me, Crystal. But what I would say is uh, Pathfinder does uh, comprehensive abortion work, of course. Uh, and uh, despite being uh, also funded by uh, US government, we have a uh, uh, policies restricting use of uh, uh, US government funding for abortion work. Uh, we use the funding from other uh, donors, uh, non-governmental donors uh, for abortion work. And, and, uh, and this, this is happening uh, currently in about, in about seven countries where we, we do policy, policy uh, advocacy work, community engagement work, and also service delivery, uh, service delivery, uh, including uh, both safe abortion and post-abortion care with uh, non-governmental and uh, by from other donors uh, funding. So uh, what we make sure to do is uh, we respect the policy and don't use the US, US government money for abortion work. I don't know if, uh, you can add something on that, Crystal. Yeah, well, I think you said it just right. Is so the U.S. government doesn't doesn't we do not use U.S. government funding for any abortion uh, services um, to perform abortions at all. It's illegal. But safe abortion care is usually what happens after. And what Steve made a really great point around is that um, many, unfortunately, many times women are for lack of a better word, just, you know, sometimes cajoled or tricked into situations uh, with providers who are not safe, they, uh, in addition to not being legal, 
and it puts women at risk and their lives at risk. And so it is important that we provide that post-abortion care for those women who many times their lives are put at risk. And that's what really is unfortunate um, for so many women around the world. And so that post-abortion care is done. Um, and many times it just frankly saves the lives of a woman um, put at risk. And that's why we're such champions and advocate for safe abortion care which means to pre the post and to let's get it legal and safe for women based on their need. Again, it goes back to what you said, just because someone is poor or living in a, in a country um, outside, I wouldn't, I would say outside of the U S I mean, it's barely legal here in some places are barely accessible in some places I should say, but outside um, we want to make sure every woman has the right when they want it to have abortion, safe abortion. And that's really important. And they shouldn't be denied because they are poor or where they live. Um, I will also say that, to be perfectly honest, you mentioned other donors, that's other, even other governments um, have really put money into this because they understand this reduces maternal mortality and morbidity. And we don't talk about that morbidity a lot, but I'm going to come back to you on that point. But the reality is, is that organizations like Pathfinder, we put our own fundraising dollars in to raise money. And particularly for our abortion safety action plan, we are, we really are trying to raise more money so that we can continue this work in countries where it's so needed. And uh, right now we have a campaign going on um, until June 30th, and we need to raise an additional $50,000 for this plan. So hopefully we've compelled you today and helped you all understand how important this all is and you are able to donate directly to the campaign or the fund or you can do it by texting to 52236 we'll put it in the chat box for you also um, that's 52236 where you can donate and make a gift directly um, to this abortion safety action plan we just know that this is a part of life-saving work and we are determined to keep it going and to make sure we're supporting the governments who are actually getting more progressive around the world um, as the United States in some cases has gotten less progressive. So I wanted to make sure we said that, so important. So I want, um, Steve, you mentioned earlier uh, maternal, uh, maternal mortality, which I think most of us understand, but morbidity. Can you speak a little bit about morbidity? Because I do not think people think about that and the impact that they have when you're poor or living in a yes. low resource setting. Yes, uh, actually, um, both uh, mortality and morbidity are quite uh, very dramatic, uh, very, very uh, tra uh, tragic. When you look at uh, what uh, uh, unsafe abortion goes to women globally in terms of uh, uh, morbidities, most of them uh, 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 long term or uh, mid term morbidity. Uh, those are complications coming from unsafe abortion, as uh, women uh, resort to methods that are not recommended, or even when they use uh, abortion pill, but uh, with incorrect information on the dose, so they face complications. Uh, most of the time, those complications include severe bleeding or infection. Uh, and in, in, in some worst scenarios, mostly in Africa, uh, women even come with a serious injuries to uh, the internal organs because of using uh, 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 foreign bodies to achieve an abortion. So those complications lead into severe damage to the woman uh, health. Uh, that could be severe infection costing uh, 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 quite uh, high in terms of comparing how much it takes to take to manage complication versus how much it takes to offer a safe abortion. Studies have been conducted, and uh, one of the uh, the latest one in 2017 showed that uh, uh, in in developing country, how much is spent on uh, uh, managing post-abortion care costs ten times ten times more. It's ten times more expensive than providing uh, a safe abortion, and uh, uh, this complication includes uh, treating women for. Uh, severe bleeding with uh, transfusion uh, or, or of uh, replacement, fluid replacement, or it can be treating many antibiotics that are given uh, 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 by injection, which is more costly than providing just tablet for a woman to have a, an abortion. And the number of, uh, of days the woman spend in the facility for managing this complication, that could vary from a few days to weeks, and sometimes even more when it's surgical for too many weeks. And the number of uh, human resources, the, the staff mm -hmm. that need to be uh, allocated to uh, treat these women uh, when they're admitted, instead of them being 
offer just a tablet, a pill, maybe uh, on, on an outpatient basis and they reduce the cost even of uh, even the bed occupancy. So mobility really implies a lot of uh, 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 consequences for women who are facing them, but also a lot of pressure into the health system uh, in terms of need to, to provide specialized care, and uh, need for specialized doctors to manage those complications uh, that that really require, require urgent, uh, urgent and immediate intervention. Yeah, and I wanted to make sure you emphasize that because again, this is all what happens when women don't have access to safe um, and legal abortions, to be honest. It really is um, important and ha can have devastating effects, um, even if they manage to survive. A couple other questions before we get to the end of time. Um, what is the place of effective contraception use? Okay. What's in place, I think, for, uh, oh, sorry. How do we effectively ensure safe abortion care is encouraged within health care facilities in Sub-Saharan Africa? Sorry, I didn't understand the beginning part, but I got that part. So how do we ensure that, so I'm, I'm assuming this is in part of uh, integrated services. How would we ensure that um, safe abortion care is there? And in, in, um, in, Where is in it Africa, illegal? Or... Yeah. yeah, yeah, they said in sub Saharan Africa okay. in the facilities, yeah. Yes, um, I, I think there, there is a need to have a, an approach that is more integrated, uh, in looking at the service delivery at the same time, advocacy, advocacy for. Uh, um, uh, removing barriers to access uh, for access to safe abortion. And uh, what we do uh, is entry point most of the time because post-abortion care is not controversial. In most countries, uh, uh, the entry point we use is a provision of post-abortion care. And from there, we could advocate for uh, 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 registration of uh, required commodity that are needed for post-abortion care. And we know the same commodity can be also used for, for safe abortion. And uh, as we are pushing, advocating for post-abortion care, we also generate data in, uh, about uh, the number of women coming for complication due to unsafe abortion, we build argument, we build, uh, we build uh, data on the uh, motivation that the government should have to also consider the inclusion of safe abortion. So uh, post-abortion being a great entry point, uh, but of course, we all we use it strategically to move also conversation around safe abortion. We start always before that is legally available, and then also engage again in further discussion in terms of uh, showing how those barriers uh, that are already in place can, can in the access uh, for many women and that uh, the, the, those, those women failing to enter there are the one coming to us with, as complications. So it's an ongoing advocacy work. At the same time, we don't leave the service delivery space empty. We do what we can do with post-abortion care and as well as with a legally available safe abortion. Yeah, and that makes sense. And it also goes along with what you were saying around the need for uh, medical abortions. Um, because again, it, it in, increases the access women have because the reality is, is that they may be in a place with few providers. And so we need to make sure we're doing, it's, it's a lot of work to be done. And again, why the resources are needed. Um, one last question was around um, any insights or opinions regarding the progress around the global gag rule, Helms Amendment. And so I uh, quickly wanted to pull up my numbers on this. So it is actually, um, Global Her Act Week, and we are focused on that. And Pathfinder is a strong advocate and a signer of, as an organization that supports the permanent repeal of the global gag rule. Uh, Steve and I talk about this a lot. It is um, very frustrating to see the US um, have a policy that we know that isn't in our values and it goes against women's health. And so it is important that the US is a strong leader and we just need to get rid of the global gag rule. This back and forth between Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, reality is, is that more people in the United States support overwhelmingly the permanent repeal of the global gag rule and do not understand why the US is putting these undue pressures on usually small organizations working in um, some of the toughest conditions around the world. So why are we impeding their work and frankly causing more financial uh, barriers uh, for implementers and partners who are working with them and, and governments to be honest. So um, we, this is a great week. We hope that uh, you all have gotten involved in some of the uh, 
Global Her Act actions this week. You can go to our website, you can go to our partners' websites and be involved in the social media. We need our members of Congress to hear from us. We have 50 bipartisan senators who have signed on to the Global Her Act. Um, it has led on the House side by Barbara Lee, Dr. Uh, Ami Bera, which is so important to have our, our doctors in Congress speak up that this is a medical decision. This has nothing to do with politics and sh politics should be taken out of it. Uh, Jan Schakowsky, and then on the Senate side, Senator Jean Shaheen. So thank them on social media. Tell them, you know, you, you support them. It's important for them to know that there are people who vote in their districts and vote in their states who are behind them 100% and that there are women who think that this is important. And I think getting to, um, this is our chance. This is probably the best chance we'll have on permanent repeal of the global gag rule. So I know I went over a little time a little bit, but Steve, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you all. And I just want to, one more reminder, again, if you want to know how you can support Steve's work and the work of Katya and others around the world who really are there to help with the advocacy and the education and, and the direct support to governments um, for safe abortion work please, you can make a tax deductible donation to our abortion safety action plan. Again, by June 30th, our goal is to raise another $50,000. Any amount, small or large, is important. This work is crucial now more than ever, and we will have a matching campaign for those funds. So again, um, Steve, thank you so much. Thank you to Katia for sharing her video um, and her direct uh, feelings from all the way from Mozambique. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Crystal Thank you. and Steve. Um, and as Crystal mentioned, uh, we would love to reach our $50,000 goal uh, for the abortion fund um, by June 30th. And so to do that, you can text HER, H-E-R, uh, to 52236. 52236, text HER, um, and that'll give you a link to give to this fund. Um, Thanks again for everything. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your interest in our work. Um, if you enjoyed this session and if you wanna see more sessions like this, please reach out to me. Um, I will put on as many as people want to join um, and I'm happy to do that. So again, thank you so much to my colleagues for the amazing work that you do. Thank you so much to our supporters for cheering us on. Um, and if you have any additional questions for Crystal or Steve, uh, you can just direct them to me, adin at pathfinder.org. Um, we will have a recording of this that I will send out and I will also follow up with everyone on email just in case you didn't get the text number to donate. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.